the floor is open for anything from comets to cosmology, anything you can come up with. Um, there's a lot of material on the table now. So our first question is from Sahar. Is there any relationship between graviton and the Higgs boson? That's a, a very interesting question, a physics question that relates to cosmology. Um, but first of all, what are these two entities? The uh, graviton is a hypothesized particle that's the, that is the carrier of the gravitational force. Uh, in the parlance of particle physics, it's a boson, a spin two particle. Um, uh, light electromagnetic waves are bosons too, so it's analogous to those. However, gravitons have never actually been observed, so it's a hypothetical particle that will travel at the speed of light, uh, and it's not yet been observed. So gravity is thought of as a field in physics terms. The Higgs boson is a another boson that is designed to impute mass into fundamental particles. In other words, it's an explanation for where the mass of all subatomic particles comes from. And the Higgs is also known more accurately in physics as a field. So both gravity and the Higgs are fields. Uh, gravity, however, gives objects their interaction with each other through the force of gravity. Higgs gives entities like particles their mass. So they are clearly related at some deep level, but basically we don't know how because there is no theory that unites gravity with the other three fundamental forces. That's the unified theory of gravity that Einstein sought his last 20 years of his career um, that various people are speculating about right now. So indeed, it's quite possible there is a profound underlying connection between the graviton, the as yet unobserved graviton, and the very recently discovered Higgs particle. Waiting for our next question. All right. Um, the next question is from Stefan. How far are we into performing neutrino astronomy? And um, oh, actually, that was from previous one. I apologize. That's Does a, the Hubble? It's a good question. Okay. We haven't had it. Okay. I'm gonna answer it anyway. So. Neutrino astronomy, I don't think we've had that question. Uh, neutrino astronomy is a, is a budding or newly emerging field of astrophysics. Um, the first neutrinos, extraterrestrial neutrinos, were detected from the sun in the 1960s by uh, experiments in, I think it was Lawrence Livermore lab, and then getting background noise. Okay. Um, so the first neutrinos were detected by Ray Davies. Uh, and it was a pioneering experiment to detect neutrinos from the sun. And in fact, there was a deficit of neutrinos in the sun, which remained unexplained for several decades and caused a lot of consternation in physics. Uh, were our models for all stars wrong, since we couldn't explain the neutrinos from the sun? Remember, in the fundamental interactions that lead to solar radiation, fusion of hydrogen to helium, neutrinos and antineutrinos are part of those particle reactions. And so the neutrinos escape from the sun very easily interacting as weakly as they do with normal matter. So this is the most easy and obvious place to detect neutrinos. It turns out that the reason that the low neutrino rate was detected from the sun is that neutrinos oscillate between the different flavors, so three different mass generations of neutrinos. The oscillation behavior was only discovered in the last decade. So neutrino astronomy was essentially confined to the sun for several decades, and even then was controversial because other experiments did not seem to agree with Ray Davies' experiment in the home state mine. Um, now we have several neutrino detectors. There are deep water detectors, the Dumont detector and off the coast of Hawaii and the deep continental shelf. And there is the ice cube detector, which is in the Antarctic pristine ice where hydrophones are essentially dropped through holes melted in the ice and you form an array. It's a very elegant idea because the particle detectors is locked rigidly in the grid of ice when the ice refreezes. And these hydrophones are detecting the very rare interactions of neutrinos in the water through, throughout the ice. Um, signals have been detected, and so the first astrophysical signals are starting to come in from these detectors, but it's still only a handful of sources beyond, for instance, our galaxy. So there's a speculation that the high energy phenomena associated with supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies could generate large neutrino fluxes sufficient to be seen at distances of billions of light years. That's the hope of neutrino astronomy, which would give neutrino astronomers many objects to study. 
The limitation of neutrino astronomy is we're not really using a telescope. So none of these detectors is able to collect and focus the radiation or the neutrinos and therefore provide a narrow direction of their origin. Basically all that can be used is timing arguments for how the neutrinos are detected within a grid or an array to give a rough directional sensitivity. So neutrino astronomy is, I would say, in a very primitive pioneering state, but it's got great promise for the future. All right, Morrow asks, what exactly is the Fermi paradox and will we ever be able to solve it? The Fermi paradox is uh, perhaps a misnomer. Um, paradox has a very particular meaning for philosophers in particular who pay attention to words very carefully. A paradox is this one or more statements that are mutually uh, contradictory and so are you know, illogical when taken together. I would say the Fermi paradox is better phrased as the Fermi question. And the question that arose from Fermi in 1950 is where are they? Um, so the history of this is in interesting because he came up with this in 1950. Now remember 1950 is before the space age and it was certainly before the excitement of modern astrobiology and the discovery of habitable planets. But way back in 1950, Fermi speculated that a modern, a moderate, uh, modest extension of our technological capabilities would have us leaving the Earth and potentially traveling through the galaxy. It might take hundreds or thousands of years, but he saw that it was within sight. So he was anticipating the space race and our ability to leave the planet. He also understood, even though astrobiology was a young field, that those likely sites for life existed. And so uh, there are likely to be habitable planets and biological experiments elsewhere, perhaps a very large number of them. And in both of these, he was correct. He combined these statements or arguments and came to the conclusion that given that we are unlikely to be the first or the only to leave our planet or explore or search the galaxy or even colonize it, the question, where are they, should be inverted and turned into, where are they? Why aren't they here already? Why don't we see evidence of their visitation? And so, of course, that becomes what's called the paradox, that Fermi is speculating that intelligent civilization should be fairly abundant in the galaxy, and there also should have been a lot of time for them to evolve, even before the Earth formed, or certainly civilizations with a big head start on us. And so why did we not see evidence of their visits, or their probes, or their robots, or their spaceships? Uh, he's discounting, of course, in this case, the idea of UFOs as alien visitations. He, like most scientists, concluded almost all astronomers I know, don't take seriously the fact that UFOs are alien visitations. So if aliens are supposed to be everywhere and technological civilizations are common, and yet we see no evidence of them, is that a paradox or what are the answers to that question? Where are they? Now one person uh, wrote a book which had I think over 50 answers to that question. So clearly there are a lot of different explanations for the absence of something. And as Philip Morrison said, he's a famous physicist too, took a great interest in SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So not seeing something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It turns out the universe and the galaxy are extremely large. Time and space are vast. And so it's quite possible that intelligent civilizations exist and they simply are rare enough that they haven't had time or they haven't had the capability to travel to us. The energy requirements are quite severe as we know for ourselves if we thought how hard it would be to travel to nearby stars. Another possible answer to the question or the paradox is that they don't care. Um, they're apathetic to our existence and that could be either because they don't indulge in space travel even though they have technology and intelligence that it's a cultural thing that we do and others do not do or they're apathetic to our existence perhaps because they don't want to make contact or because they're more advanced than us such that we have no interest to them and have nothing to teach them so they don't choose to make contact. There are many other, as you can imagine, hypotheses or explanations for Fermi's question. It seems to be a rich question just because we know there are so many habitable worlds in the galaxy that certainly motivated to wonder whether or not any or many of them have gone on to form technological civilizations that can travel through space. And the next question is about black holes. How does the conservation of angular momentum hold true while forming a black hole if it can't spin at infinite speeds crossing the speed of light barrier? So there are a couple of, uh, it's a good question because there are a couple of 
things built into that question, so let me take them one at a time. First of all, if black holes do form from the collapsed cores of massive stars, then they should obey the law of physics that conserves angular momentum. So as with the more, the less exotic collapsed states of stars, pulsars, um, pulsars, uh, remember the star, a star like the sun uh, has an orbital period at its equator of about 10 hours. So a big star, the mass of the sun, orbits in some fraction of a day. Well, if you take that star and it collapses naturally, then it will conserve angular momentum and spin extremely fast as, it's, as it becomes smaller. And that's why pulsars, uh, which are normal, slightly massive, more massive than the sun, stars collapse to distances or sizes of tens of kilometers, can actually spin once a second, or in extreme cases, hundreds of times a second. That is conservation of angular momentum in play. So that rule, of that law of physics, does govern the collapsed states of stars. And it, in principle, governs black holes too. But the edge of our description of physics is the event horizon of a black hole. So all we can really state is what the typical rotation speed of the material inside the event horizon must be overall. And that is, in fact, the angular momentum of a black hole. That's how we define it. And it is one of the few attributes of a black hole. Black holes, um, in the theory of black holes, re really only have a few properties because everything else is invisible within the event horizon. And those properties are mass, rotation, or angular momentum, and temperature, which is the feeble temperature they have caused by Hawking radiation prediction from the 1970s. So the question becomes, what's happening to this material inside the black hole? Is it rotating even faster? And the simple answer is we don't know, and the theory does not describe the state of matter inside the event horizon. The theory does, however, say, as well as we understand uh, black holes through general relativity, and the theory is basically incomplete with regard to black holes, the theory does suggest that spinning black holes will possibly extend what would have been a point-like singularity in a stationary black hole into a ring. Uh, and that ring could have time-like properties, which means in principle, if anyone were able to navigate that ring, the singularity extended into a ring in a spinning black hole, they could navigate time forward or backward, depending on how they moved around the ring. So that's a bizarre possible property of black holes as yet unconfirmed. Um, but basically, the simple answer is that the laws of physics, including the conservation of angular momentum, stop applying inside the event horizon. Okay, the next question is from Nicole. And Nicole asks, from what I understand, Jupiter's great red spot is a hurricane-type storm that has been in the same spot for decades. Is it pl plausible that the storm is also, also has characteristics similar to sunspots or that Jupiter's magnetic field plays a role? Basically, what do we know about it? So the great red spot, um, actually, is, it's more than decades. It's centuries because um, the great red spot we know has been in place since the invention of the telescope, not by Galileo. That's a common misconception, but Lippershey, Hans Lippershey in 1609 invented the telescope, or was one of the first to use it. So the telescopes, telescopes, simple telescopes, were in use um, around 1609, 1610, and Galileo, among others, was able to see the great red spot and also sunspots. Um, so we now, we know that this feature uh, is long-lived, um, and we also know that if we make a model of a giant planet atmosphere in a computer or in actually a physical simulation in a tank using liquid instead of gas, we can simulate large and long-lived atmospheric features that indeed last for decades and perhaps centuries. So we think that this is a feature that forms at the interface between the different belts of Jupiter at different latitudes or different belts of rapidly moving gas. Uh, at different speeds, so there's a speed differential, and at the interface between them, we create turbulence, and a sort of laminar form of the turbulence between belts can create a fairly long-lived, stable, rotating feature, the great red spot. And we've seen other features now on the outer planets, Uranus and Neptune, more, much more subtle, but actually also quite large. Um, the Earth could be swallowed up by the great red spot. It's a huge, a, a huge atmospheric feature. So in terms of computer models and even physical simulations, we can understand a very long-lived atmospheric feature on a planet like Jupiter. Uh, and we have indeed seen similar features on a few other giant planets. Okay, the next question is 
from Ayush as per the theory and observations made till now, anything that enters the event horizon of a black hole never comes out. What if electromagnetic radiation or energy keeps entering a black hole over large periods of time, eventually providing enough energy to the matter inside to expand against its own gravitational force? Essentially, what happens when it, as it sucks up all that light and light and matter are interchangeable? And what happens? So the black hole, uh, a black hole that is not isolated, but one in the middle of a galaxy or with nearby gas and material, will grow. And as uh, whether it's uh, ingesting radiation or matter, and as the question implies, they're related by e equals mc squared. Um, but of course, um, you know, most of the growth of the mass of a black hole comes in the form of uh, matter, because the equivalent mass of, of energy, pure radiant energy, is very small. So the largest growth rate comes from just ingesting material. So black holes will grow, and the event horizon, the size of the event horizon, is actually proportional to the mass. Um, so R scales as M, and if you actually think about that, that means that the density of black holes uh, actually rises very, uh, actually goes down as the black hole gets bigger. So black holes that are very massive, like uh, millions of times the mass of the sun, have densities less than water, whereas a black hole that's a star like the sun or slightly more massive forming obviously has a huge density like nuclear matter in an atomic nucleus. So the black hole will grow as it ingests mass or radiation. So that's the basic answer to the question. Um, and Stephen Hawking, of course, speculated to an amount of radiation, a very feeble amount of radiation that appears at the event horizon from the formation of particle and antiparticle pairs, where one member of the pair is able to escape or annihilates and creates radiation that leaves the system. That amounts to a very feeble mass loss and energy loss, of course, from the black hole. But it's, it's just extremely feeble radiation, never been detected, and probably undetectable even in principle. Um, so black holes will grow, but this growth, of course, is limited to material in the immediate proximity. So the uh, myth, if you like, of black holes as cosmic vacuum cleaners really is a myth. Um, unless a black hole is in an extremely dense region of gas, it's very hard for it to grow at any significant speed. Okay, the next question is interesting and relates to your work on science literacy. Um, Judith uh, from Coursera noticed that in her local newspaper, a group of concerned parents is trying to limit or ban the use of Wi-Fi in schools. How would you go about explaining to these parents that Wi-Fi radiation is not like X-ray radiation or even radon gas or other invisible things that are harmful? And that more generally, how do we improve the scientific literacy of the population at large? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Um, misconceptions about radiation are among the most uh, omnipresent misconceptions in, in science and the general public. Um, in, a, a, in actually a project I'm doing now, and in fact, in, uh, in a survey that students in the class, have, many of whom have taken, there are questions about what is radiation. And when that question is asked to the general public or to our non-science majors here at the university, they very often associate radiation with negative attributes. Um, as a general term, of course, radiation doesn't have to be negative at all. I mean, it carries energy from A to B, from one place to another. It can be particles, it can be waves. But radiation is not entirely negative. However, in the popular, in the popular mind, the association has been made between radiation and something bad. And that's undoubtedly due to radioactivity, and fairly prominent nuclear disasters over the time. Now, before the Wi-Fi issue that was alluded to in the question, we also remember in the last six or seven years, issues have arisen over the use of cell phones, uh, which of course use low-frequency radiation to communicate to the cell phone tower. That's the whole basis of cellular communications that we depend on and we live with. And people, of course, spend a lot of time with their cell phones close to their ear or, or on their person, and certainly a lot very close to their head. And so this became a scare of a few years ago and it was a legitimate enough concern that people did significant research to evaluate the effect of such amount of radiation, which turns out to be a very weak amount of radiation. The phones are actually really well shielded, and it's a very small amount of radiation that gives you the signal that allows you to hear a phone conversation. So basically the research is in to show that even cell phones climb to your ear for people who talk on the phone for hours a day, um, it doesn't constitute a significant health risk. 
Wi-Fi signals are in the same category because they're extremely low frequency radiation that's used, of course, so that they can uh, travel through obstacles and around obstacles and not be prohibited as infrared would be just from a, a, side, a line of sight obstruction. So basically that's the same research and it's already convincingly showed that Wi-Fi type signals at those low frequencies, gigahertz type frequencies, just have no uh, human health impact. But we have to get the message out better. Obviously, if people still hold this misconception, then it means teachers and educators and concerned citizens or average members of the public who read the real literature or the proper analysis of the literature and serious press uh, to just tell their neighbors, friends, parents, relatives, everyone they happen to meet where it comes up, oh, no, that's not something you need to worry about, and here's why. Hey, Dan on Udemy asks, is there, is it possible that there is a galaxy uh, closer to us than Andromeda, but it's just obscured somehow? That's an interesting question. There are certainly um, possible galaxies in the local group. So we're talking about the local group of galaxies and, and just to back off to the local architecture of space. Uh, the local group of galaxies includes the Milky Way, Andromeda, a sort of very similar sized galaxy, a few uh, dwarf spiral galaxies, M51, and a few other smaller spirals, and then uh, the Magellanic Clouds, large and small, which are irregular galaxies, and then a couple of dozen dwarf galaxies, true dwarfs, that are hundreds or thousands of times less luminous and hundreds of times smaller than the Milky Way. So where could galaxies be hiding in the local group? It's definitely not possible for a galaxy the size of Andromeda or even M51 to be hiding anywhere in the local group, which is within a couple of million light years, um, simply because our telescopes are sensitive to, enough to see it. Even if you imagine it lying in what's called the zone of obscuration, the zone of obscuration is the, the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. So when we look towards the center of our galaxy, or within 30 degrees of the center of our galaxy in the plane of the Milky Way, there's a huge amount of dust. And invisible light, it's like looking through a, a closed door. It's really not possible to see through the galaxy. So it could easily imagine that there's a galaxy neighbor that just happens to be along that direction and that we're prohibited from seeing in optical light. However, we're not prohibited in seeing it from infrared or radio waves. And any galaxy will have old stars. Those old stars will emit infrared radiation. And that infrared radiation travels through dust and gas much more easily than visible light. Also, the ionized gas in any galaxy will have some radio emission. The radio emission travels even more easily through obscuration. So we can rule out from radio and infrared observations any substantial companion to the Milky Way, even in that special location where it would be hidden optically. But as far as other dwarf companions of the Milky Way, to add to that census of a few dozen, well, that's more interesting. And there probably will, for example, over the past decade, there have been, I think, five or six new dwarfs of the local group found. Some dwarfs are around Andromeda. Each major galaxy has its own little coterie of dwarfs, and then there are some that are in more intergalactic space. So we do continue to find every year or so new dwarf galaxies in the local group, and they're exceedingly faint and exceedingly diffuse. It's not really just their low luminosity that counts, it's their diffuseness. Because once you have a galaxy that's hundreds or thousands of times fainter than the Milky Way and is also quite physically large, then the surface brightness or the amount of light per square arc second or region of sky is so low that it barely pokes out above the brightness of the night sky. So I would anticipate we will find some new dwarf companions in the Milky Way in the near future. Hey, you mentioned in one of the lectures that a supernova near Earth would be bad. Can you talk more about how close is close and how bad is bad? Right. So first we've got to specify what kind of supernova. So um, there are two kinds of supernovae. There are the supernovae that explode when a massive star goes off, a single isolated massive star. Um, and these are called type 2 supernovae. And these the brightest of these are the most luminous supernovae known. So we'll consider that that's the major threat. The second type of supernova happens in a binary system where a companion in the binary system just gets enough mass to go off as a supernova. And that's a more well-regulated explosion and it tends to be somewhat fainter. Both are possible uh, within the Milky Way. 
and we think they happen about once every 50 or 100 years, making it interesting that it's been 400 years plus since we've had a supernova go off in our galaxy, so we're due. So how close would a type 2 supernova, say, have to be from the Earth to cause us a problem? Uh, and people are going to argue a little bit about this. Our best evidence of supernovae comes from studying more distant examples, and in particular, 1987A, a supernova that went off in the Magellanic Clouds about 60,000 light years away. So ringside view uh, in a nearby galaxy of a supernova in 1987. So we measured the neutrinos that come off it, the high energy radiation, the blast wave. We watched it be powered by radioactive decay as those heavy elements are created in a blast wave. So we know quite a lot about the radiation from a supernova. And that's what goes into the models of what might happen if one was a lot closer than 60,000 light years. The sort of uh, classic figure of merit is less than about 30 light years, there would be a significant effect on the Earth, which is to say the radiation and the blast wave itself would have an impact on the upper atmosphere of the Earth, possibly disrupting the ozone layer. And remember, that's a very small component of the atmosphere that plays a major role in protecting us from radiation from space. Um, and so we'd see some significant effects that might affect Earth in terms of spiking mutation rates and having a lot of high energy radiation that would you know, make it a little hazardous to be outside for some period of time if the supernova was within 30 or so light years. That also would be a star that would rival the sun in brightness in the sky when it died, so quite a spectacular light show. 10 light years is sort of the critical number. If it's 10 light years, then the intensity what happens three times closer is almost 10 times more. And with 10 times more the radiation dose and the blast wave effect, then you actually have substantial disruption of the biosphere and possibly you have a, a catastrophe for life. Um, a cascading effect where um, the atmosphere destabilizes, um, where um, you know the mutation rates really go through the roof and biology is not able to adapt or recover to that situation. And the blast wave itself um, would have significant effects on the Earth. Ten light years is pretty close. Luckily, massive stars are rare, and there are very few stars that are even in the right mass range within ten light years, and there are only a couple or a handful that are evolved and massive within thirty light years. So it seems like we're fairly safe. Okay, the next question is from um Eric, who is on live, and Eric asks, can you explain the principal difference between a black hole, a wormhole, and a white hole? Okay, so black holes are uh, fairly uh, standard predictions of general relativity. They're fairly uh, routinely expected to be the outcome of a massive star dying, whether in a single or a binary system, and we have a few dozen very good candidates for a black hole. And a black hole is, of course, defined, as mentioned earlier, by its mass, its rotation. Primarily, those are the two properties that we can measure. Um, a white, holes, white holes and wormholes, which are sort of related concepts, they stem from general relativity, and they are matters of speculation. Um, because in the simple theory of general relativity, if you form a black hole in what is generally flat space-time, and our cosmic global space-time does seem to be fairly flat, it's not geometrically convoluted. Um, then that black hole is just a pinching off of that space such as to be invisible from the rest of the universe. In the white hole or wormhole scenario, that pinching off potentially connects to a different part of the universe. So you have space time that's interconnected through a wormhole. Uh, and maybe the white hole is the place there's one part of the, there's a source and a sink. So in one part there's a source of radiation and energy, and the other, there's a sink of radiation and energy and mass. Um, but the concept of a white hole and a wormhole that potentially connects a black hole and a white hole is, is pure speculation. It's not ruled out by general relativity, um, but it's a, only a prediction if you sort of work the theory pretty hard and it's not been observed. No hint of a wormhole has ever been observed in the universe. And in fact, since global space-time seems to be so flat, it's actually quite unlikely that a wormhole exists because uh, it would have to connect one region of space to a very distant region of space, which is hard to occur if there's no space-time curvature. Hey, um, the, we've had a couple questions similar to this 
um, and it's about contrafactuals and things like that. Um, but the idea is basically that um, how can modern theories of physics like dark matter supersymmetry that are unable to be proven be science? And can you talk a little bit about some of those theories and um, relate them to um, the material from the universe? course? So um, that's a good question. What, what is the epistemological status or the status in the theory of how science works of some of the more frontier theories we're working with? So we can clearly distinguish, for example, between general relativity, which is the, the currently successful theory of gravity that has many observational successes, um, which has been affirmed in what's called the weak field regime, that is where space-time curvature is not extreme, abundantly, thousands and thousands of times. Each situation of gravitational lensing seen by the Hubble is an independent corroboration of general relativity in detail, mathematically and, and accurately. So general relativity is passed with flying colors. However, its frontier is the strong field case. So where we currently hope to test general relativity is in strong field, highly spaced, highly curved space times, such as the event horizon of a black hole. So general relativity is in good state. It's a very well uh, understood theory. The mathematics formalism is quite mature. The observations support it, and more observations are planned to test it in new ways. So we can contrast that, say, with string theory, uh, which is a hypothetical theory for the underlying structure of matter, which goes beyond the level of uh, quarks and electrons to speculate that all fundamental particles, including those and all the others that can be formed fleetingly in accelerators, are indeed made of tiny one-dimensional strings that are only manifest on scales that are trillions of trillions of times smaller than an atom. That's a clear leap conceptual leap from the everyday universe or conventional particle theories. And the question then is, or the question was, um, are, is this science, you know, is this a theory that can be actually tested? And you have to ask theories this question, because if they can be tested, if they don't make both unique predictions and testable predictions, then they're not really good science. They're more like metaphysics or philosophizing. And in fact, that's how the debate is shaken down. String theory had a lot of traction in the 1980s and 1990s. It was heavily worked on by theoretical physicists and mathematicians who were enamored and entranced by the mathematical beauty of the theory. And indeed, it has its own aesthetics, if you like, its own pristine form that is quite appealing. But more hardcore or uh, pragmatic physicists were always skeptical, saying, well, it's very fun and you can play with that all those calculations, but if you can't make a prediction that can be tested in the real world, then it's not really theory and it's not really science. And, and the debate rages on. I would say the, the needle has swung from enormous enthusiasm over from string theory to somewhat of skepticism, not all the way to full-on skepticism, but mild and moderate skepticism amongst most physicists for just the reason of the questioner that uh, it is not acting like real science. Real science has to be testable. You affirm the theory, make it stronger, make it better, test it in new ways, or you disaffirm the theory or reject it based on an observation that simply doesn't fit and can't be explained away. And then you've got to do something more. You've got to find a new theory or fundamentally alter the theory. String theory hasn't been forced into that situation yet. Uh, and some people will think that if it isn't forced into that situation, it will continue to just be metaphysics. And it's not the only idea that sits in that category, but perhaps it's the most prominent because both physicists and astronomers are paying a lot of attention to string theory right now. And Stefan would like to know, are there any citizen science projects where everybody can contribute in designing algorithms to efficiently and intelligently perform data mining on the data that our probes and telescopes are providing? No, that's a good question, and the, the simple answer is I don't know. I mean, I, I only hear about on a list of the sort of more large-scale citizen science projects that incorporate uh, citizen scientists who really have no technical skills. The idea of citizen science projects working at a slightly higher level, where people are actually contributing algorithmically uh, to a project, um, that's quite interesting. Now, I know of 
large collaborative efforts where that's the case. I know it's sort of crowdsourcing amongst professional communities where people, um, you know, have tried to, for example, you know, give a particular example. Uh, one of the issues in astronomy is detecting signals in the presence of noise, detecting faint stars or galaxies in the presence of noise and sky noise and electronic noise from the CCD. And certainly there have been situations sometimes rising to the level of competitions where different astronomer groups, including students, undergraduate and graduate, have been challenged to come up with new algorithms for detecting the faintest possible signals and taking them out of noise. Those things are one-offs and they've happened only a couple of times that I'm aware of. But what you're talking about, it sounds like an actual real niche in citizen science for people of some technical savvy to actually contribute in a crowdsourcing way to serious data analysis. Um, I'm gonna have you had the question, I'm now going to research it a little myself and find out if it seems like it's an obvious niche to be filled. So Ellen has a question, and this is not something that I have heard of before. Um, she says, I am intrigued by the idea of using frozen embryos or gametes to populate habitable exoplanets. Obviously, there are serious ethical issues involved, but I'm wondering whether it might be possible to overcome the technological challenges. Yeah, so... Um, People who are looking to get over the impasse on interstellar travel, the impasse basically coming down to the laws of physics and energy, which make it extremely energy intensive for us to accelerate any large payload to even a few percent of the speed of light and head to a nearby star, recognize that the only plausible way it might happen is if humans can go into a wait state or be frozen. Um, or going to suspended animation in some form or other. And a variant of that idea, and so that's, a, that's become a standard idea. It's been standard in science fiction for decades, and it's even a scientific idea that's looked at in some detail. A variant of that idea, of course, recognizes that when you get to your destination, you're actually going to want to start a civilization or at the very least a colony. And so a more energy efficient way to go would be to have a very modest number of fully grown entities um, acting sort of as nurses, if you like, or nursemaids, or, uh, ray, or, or parents, the small number of parents, and then you populate the civilization with, with frozen embryos or gametes. And that technology in, on Earth uh, is close to being perfected. Not yet, and it has own, its own ethical issues, but it seems like it's about a decade away. Now, when those embryos or proto-people are sent into space, the biggest challenge, of course, is going to be the radiation environment because uh, with a relatively small number of cells in a very fragile evolutionary state, radiation damage and mutations could be extremely damaging to the organism if it eventually comes to fruition and is unfrozen. So I think the biggest concern there is can you protect these organisms for the duration of what might be a centuries-long travel to a nearby star? Uh, and if you don't, um, what emerges at the other end when you finally grow the embryos is going to be not a master race, but a sort of horror race. So I think, you know, not just the ethical, but the practical issues are quite overwhelming at the moment. But if we're talking about timescales of 50 to 100 years, it could well happen. All right. Uh, the next question is from somebody who is on live now, and they ask, are there any new discoveries within the grasp of backyard astronomers that they can look forward to, or is everything out of reach, so to speak? I think the area where uh, backyard astronomy is, is absolutely playing a role is the search for nearby supernovae. With a modest size, you, you do need a dark site, so it, this won't work if you live in a city or a substantial suburb. But for those uh, backyard astronomers or amateur astronomers who live in a, in a suitably dark site, rural or just generally dark and away from city lights, uh, and who have a telescope of say 10 inches or greater, um, and, and a decent CCD or, or observing equipment at the other end, which none of which is hard to get anymore. You're in the realm now of looking for nearby supernovae. So as I mentioned in response to an earlier question, the supernova rate in a substantial galaxy like the Milky Way is about one a century, one every 50 years. Um, and so if you set up an observing protocol where you were hopping around supernovae, or so right, sorry, hopping around nearby galaxies, then the math is fairly simple. If you were able to sort of 
hop around 50 to 100 galaxies, you might, even in a year, expect to make one discovery of a supernova. So this is, this is an entirely, and you'd have to be, they would be bright, um, you know, not for that whole year. So it, you also have to get a little lucky because the supernova will raise in brightness to its peak brightness where it can rival the star, the surrounding galaxy in its entirety only for a few weeks. Um, so it's not a trivial pursuit at all. There are probably 20 to 30 uh, locations around the world I know of where amateur astronomers, backyard telescopes are doing this science as we speak. And some of them have contributed several dozen supernovae. There's the one observer in Australia, I think he's the record holder, and I think he's up to about 60 supernovae himself, but that's over a few decades. Um, so supernovae is the area where the backyard astronomer can actually contribute, but it requires a fairly, it requires a lot of dedication. You really have to be willing to stick at it substantially, you know, have recreational time such that you can observe, um, not every night, but most clear nights. And you need a plan of action that is quite systematic to be able to make an interesting discovery. There are other pieces, there are other kinds of research involved monitoring variables, variable stars. There's some transient variable stars, uh, for instance, novae that come into a bright state every now and then, every few decades, or slightly less exotic variable stars like Meyer variables that are big red old stars that oscillate and pulsate. And observations of those can definitely be interesting too. So there are a few arenas where amateurs can compete. Um, uh, the next question is from Alexander, and um, Alexander asks, how does the space station communicate with Earth? Do they have internet there? Which kind of signal is transmitted best in all of space? So uh, this, the, uh, was it the space station or the, sh or the uh, shuttle? The or, space station. Yeah. So the space station um, is communicating, what is an international facility, of course, so it, it's, it has ground stations around the world. Uh, I think the two main uh, ground stations that communicate with the space station are one in Darmstadt in Germany, uh, and in the United States, it's the Gold, it's the Goldstone mm -hmm. Station, which was also used for the space shuttle. There's also a ground station in Australia, and there's a handful of others around the world. But basically, with the handshaking between two or three major ground stations, you can cover the situation of being in touch with the space station at all times. Now, I don't actually, I'm not technically up on it enough to know exactly what frequency the space station communicates at, but it does have its own uh, low frequency channel of communication. It uses fairly highly encrypted communication, even though it's not necessarily doing uh, classified work or military work, it's just seen as being protecting the intellectual property or the research that's going on in the space station. Um, so it has, a, it has a, a large amount of redundancy, of course. It has, I think, three or four different completely redundant systems of communication, such that if a transmitter went out or a receiver went out, there's more than one backup, multiple backups. And the same is true of the receiving network. While there's a core set of large dishes that do the primary telemetry and reception, there's another large set, like 10 or 12 secondary dishes that can pick up the slack in an instant. So um, the space station really can't afford to be out of touch with the Earth for more than a few hours. That would be a serious problem if it was. Um, all right, the next question is related to uh, the wormhole question from earlier. Um, I heard that when we reach light speed, we will go to another time. Um, what about reaching another galaxy? So the business of reaching light speed a dream of astronomy and science fiction, of course, for a long time. It's said to be impossible in special relativity. The formalism of special relativity, a very successful theory that explains things that happen in physics labs and particle accelerators every day, tens or hundreds of thousands of times. So it's, it's extremely robust, mature theory. Special relativity shows, and we do this experiment every time we fire up these big accelerators, that as you try and accelerate a subatomic particle like a proton or an electron to the speed of light, close to it, all the energy you add to it starts going into its mass. And so we witness this. This is indeed, this in a nutshell is why 
um, these huge accelerators, even though they're dealing with invisibly small particles, are the size of a city. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider, the best example, of course. So as you reach, uh, and, and these particles in these accelerators are moving at 99.999% of the speed of light. But as you exceed 90% of the speed of light and approach 95 or 99% of the speed of light, the equations of special relativity show that the mass of the particle increases. Essentially, you're just taking the energy you're trying to add to the particle to make it go faster, and you're adding by E equals mc squared to its mass rather than its speed. And so the particle asymptotically approaches the speed of light while all the energy you're putting into it is just increasing its mass. And you can just think of its mass increasing. So its inertia increases, which is its resistance to any change in motion. So it makes sense logically as well, thinking in terms of physics. Um, and this is, uh, of course, demonstrated in accelerators all the time. You still give the particle a large amount of energy, but you have not, even with this huge amount of energy, uh, TeV is the number, so it's uh, tera electron volts, it's 10 to the 12 electron volts um, of energy for a tiny subatomic particle, you haven't exceeded the speed of light. And essentially, physics says that it's impossible. That if you were just to keep adding energy, you'd just keep making it heavier and heavier. The speculation that there exist tachyons, which are particles that are already traveling faster than light, maybe particles that accelerate away from the speed of light to even higher speeds, sort of mirror images of the way particles behave, that is utter speculation, and it's an unconfirmed theory. And there, there have been hints of tachyons in various physics experiments over the last half century that all have been disproven. Okay, Rajesh has a question about uh, the forces of gravity on um, bodies like the Earth and like um, stars. Um, and he asks, any star should have gravitational nuclear forces acting opposite to each to stay alive and active. We know Earth has an iron nickel core, and iron is the last element a star can form uh, before it dies. Um, so shouldn't the Earth crush and become something like a neutron star or a black hole? How is the Earth stable, and what forces are helping it to remain stable, and why is that different than a star? Okay, that's a good question because it is true that in a massive star, um, as that star is creating heavier elements by fusion, the end of the line is iron, the most stable element. Um, with that most stable element, no more, no energy is gained by fusing iron to make a heavier element, and so that reaction doesn't occur. And in fact, the only way you go beyond that is iron is in the collapse, the explosive detonation of a supernova. So, a, but a star is a quite different physical situation. A star is a high density plasma. In other words, very high temperature and very high density. Um, and so the iron core of a massive star is an extremely strange state of matter because it's far denser than lead, and yet it's a gas or a plasma because it's also an extremely high energy. The electrons are all stripped off those iron nuclei. And that is, a, that is the last state of a massive star before it dies by collapse when that fusion process is exhausted. The iron that's at the center of the Earth and the Earth itself are in a quite different physical state. The Earth is a, essentially a rocky and metallic ember that formed and from leftover residue at the periphery of a star that formed the Sun. And of course the Earth is millions of times less massive than the Sun, so it's really a tiny little fragment of the solar nebula. And it formed at a periphery where the temperature was quite modest. And that's, in fact, why the Earth is a rocky planet, because the temperature in the solar nebula at the position of the Earth's orbit and the position of the other interior planets was a few hundred Kelvin. Um, that is hot enough to make, perhaps make a rock and metal molten or slightly tacky, but not hot enough to vaporize them. And so the we formed from a rocky cinder and while that rock, as it built from accretion of smaller pieces, was still fairly warm and tacky, then there was flow, viscous flow of those materials, and so the iron and nickel separated out from the rock because it was more massive and denser and had stronger gravity and settled to the core. And so that's why rocky planets have metallic cores. But their physical state and their history and their nature is really quite different from a star. A star is a, is a plasma, ball where the gas is at very high density and exceptionally high temperature, hundreds of millions of Kelvin. The Earth 
is a rocky cinder where there was some separation or segregation of the material, the iron right in the center and the lighter rocky material floating above it, but the temperatures involved were never more than a few hundred Kelvin. All right, uh, the next question is, how is the uh, difference in time between the Earth and space affected, um, or how does it affect somebody who lives on Mars or on the Moon? So like the difference in uh, time and... Oh yeah, sorry, and this is the last question. Okay. Um, right, so different times, and this is going to arise as we move through the solar system and colonize the solar system. Timekeeping will take on a different uh, demeanor. Um, as you probably know, the, the day on Mars um, is very slightly longer than the day on Earth. The, the, Earth um, the Earth and Mars have similar tilts, so Mars has similar seasons to the Earth, but the day is very slightly longer. The people that I've known who work on Mars missions, they have to keep Mars time, which is, I think, 40 minutes longer than an Earth day. And so their day, their schedule, cycles through the Earth day, which means if they're sticking strictly to their Mars mission, uh, it's very hard for them to keep family life. Now, Martian colonists will also get used to a slightly longer Earth, uh, Martian day. I suspect the, Earth, the body clock, human body clock, will be able to adjust. The human body clock has some level of adaptability, and that is a modest enough difference in the day that uh, most people think that uh, colonists on Mars will be able to adapt to the Martian day and without any serious health or sleep consequences. But in some other situations in the solar system, uh, the day-night cycle is either much slower or much more rapid. And there, the body clock will definitely be messed up, and probably people will be living in artificial situations of heat and light variation just to keep them on a roughly, roughly terrestrial clock. Um, but that's right. Throughout the solar system, as we start moving through the solar system, timekeeping is going to become an issue. And a choice at some point will have to be made whether even people traveling elsewhere or living elsewhere want to keep Earth time and that may not really make sense relative to their local environment, or whether they will jettison Earth time and live in their local circumstances, which will create some psychological feeling of dislocation uh, to the Earth, I suspect. So these are great questions, as usual, and we'll be back again next week.